Well, many of our communities are about to carve pumpkins, dress up their little ones, and hand out candy. Yes, Halloween is upon us. Are these traditions innocuous? Interestingly, Hallow's Eve is said to have pagan roots influenced by the Celtic harvest festival, Samhain, but was later Christianized by the early church. Regardless of its origin, you can't deny the attention it draws to the supernatural and society's obsession with it. My guest today is author, theology professor, and pastor, my pastor, I might add, Dr. John Thompson. And in his latest book, Deliverance, he addresses the subject of spiritual freedom. He joins me today to help unpack the dynamics of what's really going on here, whether we can see it or not. Welcome, John. It's great to be here. <laughs> so good to have you. I, there is such a fascination with the supernatural, the spirit realm, and many churches are afraid to tackle this subject of deliverance. Why do you think that is? Yeah, um, I think a lot of people are afraid because they actually don't have a biblical worldview to start with. One of the things that, yeah, I mean, you know this because we're in a church together, but before you were part of our church, we were a very conservative, very non-charismatic, non-Pentecostal church. And we were like, we don't want to touch this. We're not interested in this. Those weird people down the street deal with this stuff. We'll see them in heaven. Other than that, we're out. But if you read the scriptures, we live in an organic universe, which means that God interferes with humanity. Humanity is interacting with spiritual. So actually... To have a biblical worldview, you can't be afraid of this because this is capital R reality. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to be honest about it. You know, you talk about having a biblical worldview, yeah. right? And, and that you can't deny the fact that we live in, in right in the midst of a spiritual dynamic that's going on all the time. All the time. You know, principalities and powers, the Bible talks about that. And we know in the synoptic gospels, there are multiple references to Jesus interaction with the demonic and deliverance. Um, and even in Acts, we know that, that was certainly the case there. Uh, you know, what is so, what can we take from Jesus interactions that we need to learn and apply today in our interaction with the supernatural? Yeah. So one of the things that really helped me when I walk, walk through this academically, theologically, personally, pastorally, is I didn't just approach Jesus's conversation with the demonic, uh, as, um, sort of history. I viewed it as case study. What can I actually learn from Jesus? And uh, it was a very freeing thing. One of the wild things, and again, this is a short interview, but that was so helpful for me, is when Jesus confronts Legion um, and he, he commands Legion to leave, Legion doesn't leave immediately. Mm. And I was like, hold on, Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. All creation exists because the Father used Jesus to bring... Like, and he had the ability or they had the ability to resist him, that was profoundly helpful for me because I was like, when I'm praying for people, what am I doing wrong? Why didn't they leave? You know, I, I put up the Bethel music really loud and I said Jesus' name. What's going on? Yeah. Oh, hold on a second. This isn't a phony war. This is a real war. And they have real power. I, I get frustrated in Christian circles where like Satan has no teeth. and he, No, there are real casualties in this and there's real power in this. The question is who has ultimate power? So it was very freeing for me to see that. And, and the other thing is just to see the care Jesus had for people. Uh, there's a great example in the synoptics where a dad brings a, a, a child to Jesus. And it's a really uh, mind-bending thing because Jesus says, how long has he been like this? Mm -hmm. And he actually sends his child, if you're in the original language, it almost means from the womb. So like that messes your theology because what did this little child do, do to get this? That's not even the right question. But Jesus, before the crowd runs into, uh, see what happens, helps him. So it's not a show. Right. He deeply cared for this kid. And that's one of the things I've loved learning at the feet of Jesus is when we help people dealing with supernatural darkness, it's not a show. It's not about me. It's not about, it's actually about this person and the mercy Jesus wants to show this person. Okay, here's the million dollar question. Okay. We know demon's objective is to harm, torment people. That's yeah. the number one objective, right? To take you out. Yep. Are Christians immune from, to this threat? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So uh, let's, let's uh, work it out like this. Uh, uh, can they harm us in the ultimate sense? Absolutely not. They can't do that because Ephesians 1. Predestined, I'm a Calvinist. Really predestined, depends on where you land. But anyway, <laughs> predestined, owned, adopted, and sealed until the day of redemption. So can they take away that? No. Can they stop the resurrection that we're going to experience at the end of time? Absolutely not, because Jesus has promised, if I'm in him, I get resurrected. The question is, in between now and the end of time, can they affect us? Of course they can. They can never own us, but they can affect us in two ways. If you just read the scriptures, 
Or let's talk about the global church. 350 million of our brothers and sisters mm -hmm. right now in closed countries suffering persecution, much of it demonically oriented. They're being harmed. Right. So this is a real war. The book of Revelation says one of you might die because you're living in this environment. The other thing to really struggle with, though, too, is um, in Ephesians, I, I love Ephesians because Ephesians 1 says, here's all this amazing stuff, right? Elected, saved, adopted. Ephesians 2, seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Ephesians 3, the church is the living symbol of Satan's defeat. Uh, Ephesians 6, put on the armor of God. Ephesians 4, oh, by the way, elected, saved, all in, adopted, sign of the devil's feet. Just so you know, if you habitually play with anger, you'll give the devil a foothold inside of you as a Christian. So I just want to stop and say this. When you hear the word possession, Mark, mm -hmm. what do you think? Well, I, I can't help but have images, you know, of the All way the, that, yeah, that Hollywood has, sure. has, has depicted demon possession. But, but think about the word. When I say I possess something, what would you say? I To be filled with, to be controlled by. Right, that's right. So yeah. these are my glasses, so right. I own them. Yes. The crazy thing that we've all missed is there are five Greek words that the Greeks used to own something. They had not one, they had five. They loved owning it. They would have done very well at Yorkdale. <laughs> right? Like they loved owning things. Yeah. The wild thing is every time in an English translation of the Bible you read demon possessed, you think demon owned. But those five words are never used. It just means demon present. Mm. So here's the thing that we begin to see. You see this in Luke 13. You see this in Ananias and Sapphira. You see this in Ephesians 4. You can be saved. The spirit of Jesus is in you. You're adopted. But if you, through habitual sin, as an example, give, it's, the word is topos in Greek, foothold, inside residence, mm. they can be present but not own you. So this is the wild thing. You can be heavenly owned and still have something internally that doesn't own you, but influences you, even though you're saved. Mm. What would be a word of caution that you might offer to someone that might be dabbling in something that they think is completely innocuous, like harmless, whether it's tarot cards, they're going yeah. to psychics, they're getting readings, Ouija boards. I mean, birthday parties have Ouija boards. 100%. For Pete's sake. Well, Pete's not sake. just all of that stuff. It's, it's, even, it's, it's even like, what are you reading? What are you thinking about? You know, what authors are inspiring you? Here's what I just want to say. There is a belief in many people in North America that you have to believe it's dangerous for it to be dangerous. That's not the biblical worldview. Mm. If you play with, I don't care that Mattel makes Ouija boards and makes Barbie. It's irrelevant. If you play with fire, fire shows up. So just flee from it because actually, here's the great thing. I've, I've been involved in helping people deal with the demonic for now 20 plus years. And I've seen some pretty weird stuff and some pretty normal stuff in all of that stuff. Jesus is so much better. Mm -hmm. No, really, like you, some of you are out there playing with this stuff because you think there's going to be more power. No, there's no one more powerful than Jesus or they're going to help you. No, Jesus is the better helper. So many people begin going to these places because their prayers aren't answered, because God didn't do what he was supposed to. I'm just telling you from experience, the end game is always better with Jesus because he's just better than them. Yeah, I mean, and, and the scripture is very clear about, you know, the devil coming as an angel of light, oh. right? Always masquerading as Jesus as the real thing. But right. he's not. It's not until you get down the road that you realize that I it's serious? not the real thing. Right. Um, uh, here's an honest question for sure. someone watching right now, John. Should we be scared? Uh, so that's a great question. And the answer is no and yes. So, yeah. sorry. Uh, let me work it out now like I'm completely this. Confused. No, 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 no. <laughs> let me just do it like this. Uh, should we be ultimately scared? No. No. Listen, Jesus has defeated these things. Colossians 2.15 is my favorite verse. It says when Jesus rose, rose from the dead, it gives heaven's view of what happened at the cross. It literally said the demonic had to parade behind Jesus because he had defeated them. That's the truth. Uh, do they have ultimate power? No. They are ancient, but we serve the ancient of days. They're incredibly powerful. Our God is all powerful. It, it's, it's a different quantity. But should we have a healthy respect and fear for them? Of course we should, because this is not a game. This is a real war, and we have to take them seriously, but take our God more seriously. Yeah. For someone that's watching right now that may feel like they're dealing with some kind of oppressive spirit. Yeah. They're not sure. What might be a checklist that you would have them go down or to be able to identify that, that which may be tormenting them is coming from a spiritual first, source? Yeah, first thing, always do this in community. Never do this alone. 
uh, hang out with pastors, hang out with a Christian counselor, like do some work beforehand because it might be mental illness. It, it actually might be you. You know, a lot of people love blaming stuff on mm-hmm. the devil. And, and we have three enemies, not one. We've got worldliness, which are world systems. We've got our sinful flesh stuff that we like doing stuff we shouldn't. That's why it's called trespassing. Not allowed to go to that place. And then there's demonic influence. Um, you know, in, in, in the book I've written at the end, there's some checklist stuff. But I, I still think even Neil Anderson, though I arrive in some different places than him, even his, his, in his book, The Bondage Breaker, how he does some checklist stuff at the end, that is very, very helpful. But I, I think the, the great thing is if the person listening is a Christian today, is to, without fear, sit with Jesus, the true Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Son of God, and say, look, could you begin to help me understand if this is even true? By your spirit. Because if it's not, help me understand. And if it is, great. And would you begin to lead me to people that are going to be able to help me? He is amazing how he, there's divine setups everywhere I go, where in all sorts of churches, someone is struggling and suddenly the right person comes at the right time. But I think a checklist to go, do I really, have I participated in things I'm not supposed to? Has my family been doing this? Ethnic origin stuff too? Mm-hmm. Has my family or ethnic community been dedicated to a certain God or tri- uh, tribal uh, deity? All of that's uh, a beginning point. And I know it's a short interview. You're yeah. like, oh, that could be five hours of conversation. For the person that's watching that hasn't made the decision to follow Jesus, yeah. that's a very different conversation totally because different. I know the starting point for any deliverance that, that you and your team, your ministry team are a part of, starts with a decision to make Jesus yeah. number one in your life. Yeah, so the question that we have to wrestle with as human beings is who do we want owning us? Because the belief that we own ourselves is just a lie. And the scriptures are clear, there's only two kingdoms and two kings, or two princes. And so either you're owned by the kingdom of darkness, that doesn't mean every non-Christian is evil and possessed, Mm -hmm. it just means positionally, they are owned by the kingdom of darkness. And the only way to get full freedom is switch sides. And the only person who can help you switch sides is Jesus, because Jesus is the only one who kept the law of God perfectly. He's the only one who had the power to die in our place and deal with sin. He's the only one who's come back from the other side and has told us what it is. He's the only one who's broken death, and he's the only one who faced down Satan and took him out. So if you want to switch sides, the only way to switch sides is through the guy who's done the work. And it's not about you, it's about him. Because what, we, what do I bring to the table? Nothing. I have got nothing, but he's got everything. Yeah. So you got to just say, like, Jesus Christ, Son of God, you know, second person of the Trinity, you got to do the work for me if I got to get free because I got nothing. Well, that's so good, John. And there's so many layers to this subject. I know we've just scratched the surface, but the takeaway is that Jesus came to set the captive free. And thank you for sharing that, for unpacking that for us today in our brief moments together. And for those of you that are watching, that something about what John said about wanting to change sides. If you want to leave that kingdom of darkness and start a relationship with Jesus, we want you to know that we've got prayer partners that would love to introduce you to the person of Jesus and start you on that journey. The phone number is 1-866-273-4444. We are there any day of the week, 24 hours a day. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. We are there for you, and we would love to pray with you in that regard. John, thank you for being with us, reminding us, and encouraging us that freedom is possible. And uh, God bless you. Yeah, thanks. You too.